Uh, hi, this is Wayne from Root River Rod Co. Uh, today we're going to tie a deep sparkle pupa, which is an imitation of a caddis fly. Um, it is, in my opinion, a uh, underfished fly uh, during the hatch sequence. Um, primarily, um, a, a caddis will um, pupate uh, at the bottom stream bed. And then once they're finished pupating, they will chew out of their, 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 their pupil case and begin to ascend to the surface to hatch into an adult. What's unique about caddis flies as opposed to mayflies is mayflies tend to make a quick and aggressive move from releasing from the bottom and going straight to the surface. What's kind of unique about caddis flies is that they have a tendency once they release from the pupil uh, case, they will drift along the bottom of the uh, the creek in the drift line, uh, and they can drift for hours and for great distances before they begin the process of rising to the surface and, and hatch out. Um, <clears throat> that is a portion of the hatch that I think is underfished, and that's what I want to focus on with today's video is uh, a, a fly that will uh, uh, offer a solution to that and the techniques that we need to employ to keep our fly where the fish are focused. And from that, let's go start tying this deep uh, sparkle pew. We're gonna begin uh, by tying on a size 16 uh, jig hook with a, a three uh, millimeter copper tungsten bead. Um, I always like to uh, use super glue to attach the bead to the shank. I particularly like Loctite. And so we're just going to put a little bit of super glue right at the bend here where the jig eye begins. And then we slide the bead up over the super glue. And you come in with the back of your thumb and press, it'll align it straight up on the hook shank and give it a second to dry. <clears throat> Next, what we're going to do is we're going to put down our, our thread and what's different with this fly, which is called a, a Jiggy Pupa, which is a version of Gary LaFontaine Sparkle Pupa that Mike Mercer came up with years ago. Um, is we're going to attach the thread. This is uh, Vivas Rusty Brown 14 knot. Attach it with the jam knot. And instead of covering the whole hook shank, we're only going to cover a third of the hook shank. And you'll see why in a second. Um, one of the games I play with myself when I'm tying flies is I like to use my scissors, my scissors as, as less, least as possible. Um, one of the ways we can do that is learn how to break the thread off uh, clean without using our scissors. The little trick is you pull uh, the opposite direction with your bobbin and then give it a snap and it just comes right off. And I'm going to take this thread and I'm going to wind it right back up to the bead. And then I'm going to do uh, a very a light olive deep sparkle emerger. I'm specifically going to be imitating um, um, a caddis fly with the common name of granum. Um, scientific uh, genus, it's the Brachiocentris. It's uh, the little cased caddis that we all see when we turn over rocks in the driftless area. It has a, a case, it's a four sided case built with small pebbles, very dark. Um, the caddis uh, insect itself has a bright green body. Uh, this is where the Peking caddis fly comes from. But what we're going to do is we're going to imitate the stage of the insect uh, as it first leaves its, its pupil home and begins its trip to the surface. Uh, we're going to use uh, Sparkle Emerger yarn from Hairline. And what this is going to do is it's going to create um, what we call the pupil sheath. Um, what happens from a biological perspective when the insects chew and release themselves from their pupil case, they are uh, using various gases uh, with, that they produce in their body 
to create lightness that gets them to float to the surface. Um, those gases um, attract air bubbles. The, uh, the caddis itself, with all the little different hairs and things of that nature, attract the air bubbles, which creates a very, very predominant sheen that we'll see once we start to work with this fly and get it to uh, completion. I'm cutting off a single strand of, of sparkle yarn here and I'm going to cut this in half just for ease of control. Switch it to my other hand. Uh, want to cut that, make sure we have everything square and even because what we're going to do is we're going to, when we tie this on with a simple pinch wrap, is we're going to pull the fibers to length next to the bead and then a locking wrap and then we're going to hold our materials straight up under tension above the hook shank and with tension again on the thread because remember when we're tying flies tension is control and tension is durability we will wrap and concentric wraps touching all the way down to where our last thread wrap was right here and that is going to be our single point of reference for when we're tying this fly and where all our materials are going to end. I'm going to take a uh, lap back up to the bead and what we're going to do is we're going to put in a core. And what, you, what do I mean by putting in a core? Well, we have to remember that this sheath is covering the insect itself and as you see that if we we tie the fly like this we do not have an image or a silhouette of the insect inside the sheath um, you know that can tell the fish that it's not worth eating because it's an empty shuck um, there are theories out there uh, that support that so what we want to do is we want to put this core in to basically give us the um, illusion of a insect within the pupal sheath. Uh, when Gary LaFontaine uh, invented the sparkle pupa, what he did is he put a, a sparkling yarn on top and then sparkling yarn on the bottom and then folded them over and then dubbed along the shank. By doing that, he created the core in the middle here, which was the insect. And that was very important to him. Um, I had the great pleasure of spending uh, several hours over the course of many years with Gary tying flies and asking him questions. And uh, the uh, having the core or the silhouette of the insect within the pupil sheath was very key to him. Also, what was very key to him was sparseness. Uh, one of the, one of the uh, determining factors that he used to whether the fly was met his standards is whether you could hold the fly up to the light and see through it. So uh, what I've done is I've just grabbed some dubbing. I've grabbed some Senyo's Fusion Dub. Uh, any dubbing will work. This is what we have at the shop here. What I've done is I've picked a color that uh, I, I like to use to imitate the core. It's coppery, it's got some red in it, a little bit of green. It's just, it just looks nice. It's not an exact match to the insect, but uh, you know that's okay. I'm pretty sure the trout don't care. So I'm just going to clip that square, switch hands, because... I tie left-handed and I'm ambidextrous and I do a lot of things backwards. I apologize for that. Uh, I'm going to tie this core in. Same way I tied in the uh, pupil sheath or the sparkle yarn. I'm going to pull that to length. Don't worry about all these straggly bits here. That We want straggly bits. When a caddis fly hatches and is emerging, whether it's coming from the, 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 the pupil case from the bottom or whether it's penetrating the meniscus to, to turn into an adult, it is a mess. There's hairs everywhere, there's legs everywhere, there's air bubbles everywhere. The thing is just a mess. And that is why the sparkle yarn is such an important factor in the materials used to create this insect because it, 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 it gives us that messy effect 
that throws off the light pattern that the trout are expecting to see. So I've got my core in here. I'm going to measure it to the length of the shank and I'm going to cut it just a little bit short, just like that. My next step is now to fold over this material over my core and secure it down, thus creating the bubble effect. There's a lot of ways to do that. I, I like to do it with my scissors. You can do it with your hands like this, hold it back, you know, and do that. That's, that's a good way to do it too. I prefer scissors because this is the way I, I learned how to do it. So I make a bubble. I'm not particularly uh, concerned about its size right now because I can pull it to shape and to size after I attach it. The one thing I do want to make sure of though is I get those sparkle yarn fibers to distribute and not clump up around the fly. I like the way that is right there. I'm going to come in. I'm going to hold everything tight to the shank. I'm going to come in with a loose pinch wrap and then I'm going to pull up and tighten it. The reason I pull up is that causes the, the loop that I just did with the pinch wrap to come down in a straight angle and not come off as an angle or slide along the rounded hook shank. It's an old Atlantic salmon flyer tires trick and it's how they mounted quills and everything like that that back in the old days. Um, so you can see now I've got the sheath here. I've got my core that now has eliminated the space in between the upper and lower sheath. And now all I'm going to do is, is gently grab all the materials and just start to gently pull. And I want to pull straight and I want to continually to uh, massage these materials to where I want them and to the, get the size I want. I like that bubble effect right there. I want it to go just a little bit past the bend. I'm going to securely wrap that in. I'm going to come down to my tie-off point right here and from there I'm going to build a head and some legs and other things. Um, with materials that are very um, uh, have a tendency to, to fray and to, and to get all over the place. Sparkle yarn is one of them. One of the great ways to cut it and to get control is to, to grab the materials, twist it, it twists it all into a single point. I can come in with the point of my scissors and snip it all off cleanly. That works with any material. So now you can see that I've got my core established. I have my bubble established. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to create the head and the legs. What I'm going to use for that is uh, some hairlines. Here's your plus. We have this at the shop. Uh, I'm going to use uh, some what I would call some complementary colors here. Um, you know, basically the head of a pupa is generally dark brown, black, something like that. Um, in the fly tying world, we've got some play with that. We can do some different colors if you want. You can see I got all these different colors here. I can mix and match, but for this fly, I'm going to stick pretty traditional. I'm going to um, take a little bit of dark brown. Here's your plus. It's got just a little bit of, of Antron in it and, and lots of spiky bits that I'm going to use as legs. I don't want to use anything super sparkly. I don't want to use ice dub. I don't want to use something like that. I've got sparkle. I've got the sparkle yarn right here and the sparkle is in the name. I don't need any more. Um, too much is going to create a light pattern that could be offensive to the fish. And that's the last thing we're looking to do. We want to exaggerate characteristics without going over the top. When we exaggerate a characteristic, we can separate our fly from the rest of the food in the drift line. If we go over the top, we can uh, create a situation where it's too gaudy and the fish will ignore it because it's not what they're looking for. So always keep that in mind when you're tying your flies. You Flash is good. Too much can be too much. Um, and, you know, and obviously just use your experience and uh, time on the river to, 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 to show you what, what, what works in your area. So I'm just going to tie on a little bit, dub on a little bit of this dark brown. I don't want to spin it on super tight 
because I'm going to brush it out and use it for legs. So I'm just going to do a loose dub. Remember what we talked about. It doesn't have to be neat. In fact, we don't want it neat. We want it to be sloppy. I'm going to put a little, little bit more on. I didn't quite get as much on there as I wanted. A little bit more. That's good. Yeah, that's going to be a nice sloppy fly. Now I'm just going to take a little light brown. Fish don't care, but it's just a nice little effect on the fly. A little color change, a little modeling. Like I said, I don't, you know, I haven't, I haven't had a conversation with a fish in a long time to see what they feel about this. I, I have a feeling they don't care though. So same drill, I want to put that on loose. And I want to create this big haphazard, ugly looking head that, like that, with all the spiky bits all over the place. And then I'm just gonna fold back all that spiky stuff. I want to keep that. And then I'm just gonna finish the fly off. As with all my flies, I, I use Loctite as my glue. I spread just a thin layer on the thread. And Loctite does this really good because it's really viscous. It comes out, it's not quite like water, but it's damn close. And as you can see, I have the, the super glue on my thread. One, two, three. That locks it up. I've got some leftover super glue on the thread. I did that on purpose. I slide my whip finish through that glue. And that fly is not going to come unraveled because the head comes undone. And I snip that off. So the fly is done, but it's too pretty. We need to ugly it up. So I'm going to come in with one of our uh, Root River Rod Co dubbing brushes. I'm going to grab a hold of this uh, bubble back here and I'm going to pick this out and I'm going to be, this is for legs and um, general ugliness which is what we want to build into our caddis pupa and then we just wet our fingers bring this all the way back. You can see how those fibers now come back and start to look like legs. Um, we have some of these fibers are long. Um, don't go too crazy trimming these. You know, we, you heard me talking about how ugly and disheveled the caddis fly is. And the last thing we want to do is use all that fly tying technique to build in roughness and then clip it all out. Now we're just going to take that bubble, come in there with your thumbnail, press it up in there, and you get that to support up. And so when we're fishing this, because that's only attached at a central point, we're going to get some movement out of that. We're going to get some movement out of the legs. We're going to get a correct representation of what the insect looks like when it's on the bottom and drifting along. We, I'm just going to wet my hands on. This is what that fly is going to look like. You're going to get, we're going to get a lot of, uh, uh, bubbles attaching to the materials here and we're going to get the right effect that the fish is expecting when it sees a uh, hatch of, of brachycentris granums come off. Um, that's what they're looking for. As this has got a three millimeter bead, it's intended to be fished close to the bottom. Um, what we can do uh, later as we're fishing and as the hatch matures and there are maybe less and less uh, pupa right on the bottom and as they start to uh, ascend towards the surface, this is where the 2.3 millimeter bead, the 2.5 millimeter bead comes in handy because it will present the fly higher into the water column. Last but not least, if we look at this fly and we imagine it being a dry fly and how close it looks to the original sparkle pupa and we're going to tie this fly later 
in our video series is that we can put a deer hair wing on there and all of a sudden now we got a dry. We have a dry sparkle uh, emergent pupa without the bead, of course, and using almost 100% of the same techniques, except we'll go into putting a wing on and we'll do that, uh, uh, we'll do that in another video. This is Wayne from Root River Rodco. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you uh, picked up a couple of tips. Um, if you'd like to see us do some more videos that get more into entomology and how we approach that uh, in the shop and tell our, um, our, our guests, and et cetera, uh, put a comment in and let us know what you'd like to see. We'd be more than happy to uh, accommodate that.